All right, moving along to our next scenario. And here we have our site 1, 2, and 4 that require to have internet access, which is being simulated by the switch 1 loopback 42. So here for our configuration task number 2, internet, we need to configure R4 to provide internet connectivity to switch 1 loopback 42 from R6, R7, and R8, loopback 10 through 12. Okay, the traffic must follow the default route. We have to prepare for the possibility of IP address overlapping between the VPN sites. We are not allowed to configure any more static routes on switch one. And we have to make sure that whatever we have accomplished in task number one continues to work the way it should. Okay, going back to our diagram, now we're going to be providing internet access. Let me kind of get rid of this real quick. For our three sites to loop back 42 this time. But we're going to use a static route, so we're going to have to configure static route on R4 pointing to switch run as the next hop, and then again redistribute static, which we already have configured. So all of these sites will be receiving a default route from R4. And in order to address the overlapping IP uh, problems, we're going to have to enable a VRF aware NAT on R4, so as soon as the traffic leaves R4, it's become NATed IP. Okay, so that way R4 keep tracks of all the traffic that goes through it and know exactly what return traffic has to be placed into which VRF, okay, regardless of the IP being overlapped. And as you will see, there will be enabling NAT per VRF as well. And usually for the traffic that go towards the internet, the NAT has to be performed anyhow to convert or translate the private IP to the public IP. Okay, so first let's configure the static routes on R4. For the default route, so here we are now for the IP route VRF C1, quad 0, next time 162.16.104.10, and we need to get out into a global routing table, so we enter the option global, name INET for internet, and then we have an IP route for VRF C2, then we have to advertise that into the BGP, Okay, under the IP address family, VRF C1. Just going to use the network command to advertise our default routes. Okay, C2, same thing. Then let's jump over to R1 real quick and make sure that both VRF C1 and C2 on R1 receives the default route, which it did. Okay, next we need to configure uh, network address translation and we have to match the interesting traffic. Instead of doing permit IP any any to match our type of traffic, our task right here mandates that the what do we do here does not affect what we did in task number one. And task number one requires the traffic to get to the share services subnet to use the true IP. So we cannot perform any network address translation for those traffics. So for our IP access list that matched the interesting NAT traffic, we're going to have to first do a deny of IP coming from any going towards the share service subnet. Okay, so make sure those traffic doesn't get NAT. And then we can just do permit IP any any. Okay, now to configure the NAT, the IP that we're going to be NATing to, since we are not allowing any more static routes, that kind of implies that the only IP that we can NAT our traffic to that has to belong to the subnet right here. Right? If it belongs to any other subnet, you're going to require a switch one to have a static route pointing back to R4. So just to keep things simple, we're going to be using the interface at fast 0 IPs as our NATed IPs. So we'll just do a path, basically. So IP NAT insight source, okay, we're going to do list, tie that to the ACL, and we call that VRF NAT. And we're going to NAT the traffic to the interface IP, and that interface we said it's going to be fast, zero, zero. And the question mark, this is where you implement the first aware NAT, since you configure the NAT specifically for a particular VRF. So first will be VRF C1. And then for PAT, we do overload. Okay, we use the exact same command, but with VRFC2. So you can see that you kind of configure it twice for the NAT, one per 
PRF. Now we're going to have to, just like any other router NAT configuration, configure or define the interface for the NAT inside outside. So the fast 00, zero will be our outside, and then here we have the three inside interface, which is on router R4, serial 00, zero, zero, one, and zero, 02. So first interface fast 00, zero, IP NAT outside. Okay, and then you have interface 0000, zero, zero, zero IP NAT inside 0, zero, 001. 002. All right, now just to test, let me enable a debug on the switch one so we can see what IP is hitting switch one. Let me clear log your debug IP ICMP and then from R6, do a quick ping to 4222 since we said that we're going to use loopback 42 with the IP 4222 to simulate our internet source from loopback 10. See that's working. Then we can hop to our seven ping four two two two. So it's gonna be back ten. That's pinging, and then R eight ping four two two two. So it's gonna be back ten. Okay, so that's working as well. Now go back to switch one and check our debug. You can see that all of the pings are being seen by switch run is coming from 172.16.104.4, which is the fast 00 interface on R4. Okay, now to also confirm that on R4, we can do show IP net translation, and then we can look at the net table per VRF. Okay, right here, there's a VRF option. First, C1, you can see here the net Entry is not really hasn't really timed out yet, so we can catch it, and then C2. So the one from router R6 looks like it, it timed out already for the NAT entry, but for R7 you can see there's a NAT entry for C1, and then R8 NAT entry under VRC2. Okay, we just show access this. You can see that we also have three matches for the permit IP any any for our NAT access list as well. Okay, so we know that is working. We just want to go back and make sure that our task number one, or what we did in task number one, didn't get affected. So going back to R6, and then do a ping to 10, 10, 0, 1, source from loopback 10. You can see we continue to be able to ping that. There's, not, there's no NAT entry under the C1, which is what we want, because we didn't want it to NAT. If you show IP access list, you can see we got five matches for our deny statement and on switch one if we do a show lock one more time we should be seeing a ping to loop back 10 that's coming from the true IP which is 6601. Okay so our solution for task number one continues to work as you can see that. And that complete our task number two. So as you can see that allowing the return traffic right here without the NAT, which is what we did in task one, is kind of troublesome because that requires you to manually insert traffic back to the VRF, whether you use the regular VRF selection feature or VRF selection with the PBR, which is what we did in this lab. But with the NAT, which is what we did in task number two, we didn't really have to worry about how the return traffic gets inserted back into the VRF because it's kind of taken care automatically by the VRF aware function on the router. Okay, one thing to kind of note here is that we have to create the corresponding VRFs on the R4 for those who have any access to the share services. So these might not be scalable if you have to create a lot of VRFs for your customers on your share services PE router. And you still cannot have overlapping IP in the customer network because if you remember when we were configuring the IP access list as part of the VRF selection, route map, we had to specify a unique destination subnet in order to match the return traffic and place them into appropriate VRF. So taking a no VRF approach when building a shared service for MPLS VPN still doesn't help you or allows you to have overlapping IP for your customer. And in that case, you might as well put the shared services into the VRF as you will see in our next lab video. And that will help you cut down the amount of configuration a lot that you have to do. 
since you no longer have to deal with manually placing the traffic from the default VRF to each of the individual VRF. Okay, and that wraps up our video on MPLS VPN share service and internet with no VRF. You can visit our website to view an extensive list of our lab videos and sign up to get access to additional lab contents. Thank you for watching labminutes.com, and I'll see you guys in the next video.